Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, and many more and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the Skubani e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Skubana is a software platform to manage your entire e-commerce operation that also integrates with Andisha, uh, today's founder. Today we have Amin Keshvi who co-founded Andisha with Dr. Harry Whitehouse in the 1980s. We're going to find out the pre-Amazon days. Andisha is a leading provider of e-commerce shipping technologies with more than 12 billion in postage printed. They help send over 500 million parcels of mail per year and account for over 60% of all online postage printed in the U.S. And they basically, they help businesses run their shipping operations by printing shipping labels or online postage right from your desk. Amin, thanks for joining me. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to, to talk about this and it's really amazing what you've created uh, with this. So congratulations with that. Thank you. Thank you. It's always ex exciting. We always look at it every day and say, wow, what did we do? <laughs> And we'll talk about the early days when you, you maybe didn't even suspect it would get this big. But I want to talk about integration. And it seems like this is huge for partnerships, for, for people integrating with you and you with the post office. Um, so how did the, you know, talking about the sponsor, you know, how did the relationship start for Scubana to integrate with Andisha? You know, that's a great question. I mean, you, you look at a great entrepreneur like, like Chad and his, his idea of his business, right? I mean, I think it started him and his father, right, had a business that was an e-commerce business. Exactly. And they were using tools in the industry. And Chad's idea about, oh, let's take this tool and instead build our own that other businesses can use, given his experience as, as, as a user, if I recall correctly. Yeah. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, Chad's and his dad's company used to use a partner of ours, which was already an Indisha partner. Mm. So I believe that's where the link started. Yeah. His experience using us, and and you know it's it's kind of like a little a little positive disease that comes that spreads, right? <laughs> I mean, Indisha with one partner, and then you we see a lot of customers uh, will take us from one entity to another. So maybe today they're a small company using a accounting package. Tomorrow they're using like a, an MRP system. They will like to continue the relationship with Indisha because of the relationship we build with our customers. So. I, um, I suspect that's what happened with Chad. He yeah. used us in, in his dad's business. And then when he created his own business, he looked at this and said, we need to be able to offer our customers shipping labels. And Disha is the partner of choice. And, and then he reached out to us. And I mean, I like his story. I mean, I just always enjoy entrepreneurs and, and, and founders. So him and I hit it off and yeah. had some good chats in the early days of uh, Scubana. Yeah. So I want to hear about you reaching out to the, you know, because at that point, when you were early on, the post office is the, the giant. And right now, you're the giant. So how is it, I mean, you're probably picky on who you integrate with because it's your reputation also. How do, what, uh, how do you find it that people best approach you, um, you know, to actually integrate? And how, how does it work as far as you, you know, vetting out people that you don't want to work with or integrate with? So it, it's an interesting balance because, yes, there's a vetting process, but we, we're pretty humble in that you really don't know. If, if somebody is ethical and straightforward, you basically look at them at, at, at face value and say, okay, that's a start, right? That, that's how you look at different entrepreneurs. Because a lot of times it's hard to look in the future and say, oh, do we integrate with this person because they're going to be successful? That's really probably not the right way to look at things. Yeah. So we basically built an open platform for people to innovate, mm -hmm. integrate with us, and then we'll sometimes, you know, step in and say, you know, you're interesting. Let's help build your business. Let's introduce you to our sales team. Let's introduce you to other customers. Yeah. Let's do a customer success story. We like to be very customer centric. Yeah. But let's take an example of a partner that may be integrating us. If we have a joint customer, that customer will speak loudly why they selected that partner, for mm -hmm. example, versus another. And that's usually what builds the, the relationship because now it's a differentiator or it's an innovation, or it solves a problem, and we keep track of that, and then we'll work with them, because a lot of times a customer will come to us and say, I use this marketplace or this accounting system, who do you recommend? And we usually will have three or four partners mm. that may fit that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, and so, so it, it's it's really, you know, we have a whole, used to be one of us, now we have a whole team of business development group right. 
that works with folks like Scubana. Yeah. So early on, I mean, who are some of the first integration partners? Oh wow. Uh, I was. This is an interesting story, actually. I yeah. would say the first, about our first year, we were one of the first companies that built a little tool that let companies integrate with us. And I would say the, we went to the first eBay show. There was yeah. 15 booths. I what remember. year is this about? It would be about oh, two maybe. Okay. Somebody can look up eBay one. The first eBay conference was in Anaheim. Yeah. And I remember we went around trying to say, tell people, hey, integrate with us. Auction management companies, for example. Right. And everybody was too busy because they were busy building the photo updaters and, and you know the kind of stuff that just made it work. Mm. So by the second year, I think one of the first companies that integrated with us was probably Zuvi. They were a company in San Diego, if I recall correctly. And then slowly their competitors said, oh, if we want to compete, we've got to integrate. Mm. So by year two, we, were, we had a couple of integrations. By year three, companies were coming to us say, telling us, do we have to pay you to integrate? So it went from we were begging to now we couldn't keep up. So, you know, it's the typical three, I call it the three-year cycle, you know, that trust factor. They see yeah. you three years in a row, they say, okay, you're real. Yeah. Um, but by year four, probably every, I call them the auction management companies, and there were about a dozen of them. Every one of them at one point or another integrated with us uh, at that point. Yeah, so who was the first one that came to you who you thought, I think we, not made it, but we're, we're on the map now. <laughs> I think we used the term, we're real. We're real, yeah. The real business. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not sure if it was the partnerships or more the number of customers, because mm. at some point or another, we were solving problems for customers, yeah. and then the partners started acknowledging it, because if, I, you know, I used the example earlier, if a customer goes to a partner and says, oh, I'll use you, but only if you also integrate Indisha, because I, I ship with Indisha, but now I've gotten bigger. Let's say somebody who sells on eBay four or five packages a day. Right. They may use us directly. Now they get to 10 a day. Now they want to manage their orders, so they, they go looking for an automation platform. Mm. And all of a sudden, that platform doesn't support Indisha. They're like, wait a minute, I don't want to automate my orders and take a step back in my shipping. Right, right. And, and so, so they look that, for an automation tool that uses Indisha in that situation. Exactly. And that was very helpful, because I think by year... Somewhere where we hit 7,000 customers or 10,000 mm. customers, 2003, 2004, all of a sudden we had that momentum. You know, the online selling community was still early. You mm. know, your platinum sellers, your titanium sellers on eBay, the power sellers as they call them, those drove a good amount of, uh, uh, share, you know, uh, mind share. We were on the eBay boards. You know, yeah. there, was, there was about three shipping forums. And those really marketed us very well. Because we kept solving problems. Harry was great at this. He would be on the boards and he'd answer questions. Hmm. No, the signature was in Disha, but we were solving problems. Right. And that in itself built the momentum because we became the expert to answer questions about shipping. Right. And remember, you're talking 02, 03, tracking was barely known. Yeah. Right? People were standing in line at the post office to drop off packages. Yeah. Um, and so we had really created a big momentum by especially the part-time sellers on eBay. Those folks, you know, they had they would have 20 minutes a day dropping off the parcels, and we kept innovating to solve right. those 20, min 20 right. minutes a day for them. It's painful to stand in line at the post office. I mean, that's well, it's yeah. more about uh, we had part-time moms, for example. They would we heard stories to drive to the post office, and the baby would fall asleep in the car. So now, what are you going to do? You know, right. and, and it's always, I mean, you said you had two kids, right? Right. You know, exactly. Baby falls asleep, you're not leaving them in the car. You, right. And so we solved that problem by giving them back right. those 20 minutes a day. That's a good tagline. And Disha, solving your baby, not sleeping. <laughs> Don't leave we your baby this. in the car. We heard, we yeah. had stories, people that would come to our, so we did the eBay show the five or six years it ran. Every year mm. we'd run it, and we would have people in the aisleways. We had customers coming in and helping us do demos because we were a very small time. Wow! And 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 I remember that's the amazing. Stories, the, the personal stories, because then you really are, you know, especially yeah. you had the recession. So some people that became their livelihood because they lost their jobs mm. in 2000, 2001. So we have a lot of fun stories or good stories, I should say. Success what's one of your favorites? Of that. Yeah. What's Sorry? one of your favorite stories that you that you think back on? Oh, um, there's a woman who runs a scrapbooking company in Orlando, and I uh, always think very highly of her um, because they had just had a child, so she had left her work. Her husband got laid off, 
And here she is, the, the hobby scrapbooking. They're trying to figure out what to do. Right. So it was a travel scrapbooking company. And uh, she basically started the business. And she came at eBay Live. Uh, she had a Yahoo store, believe it or not. And she came to eBay Live and bumped into me at the booth. And we chatted about, what do I do? Is this a real business, not a real business? And we hit it off. You know, yeah. she, she was being creative. Yeah. Uh, what would you tell her? And uh, I was... I mean, basically, based on her local enthusiasm, people who bought from her already, she already had a business, but she just wasn't sure how to how to take it. And so yeah. we talked about the hassles of shipping. She was the typical entrepreneur yeah. shipping on the kitchen floor, yeah. which was very typical if you think of the startups back yeah. in the one or two or three, before they end up in the garage, before they get to the warehouse. Right, you know, it's, right. It's the stages <laughs> of online selling. Right. And uh, she did that. And by the next year, she had a couple of people working at the house. Three years later, she has a warehouse mm. and it's a real business, and she wow. has eight people working for her. And you know, and I was on a panel with her with uh, really. I think there was her, J.C. Penny. You know, some some. That's amazing. That, and she's looking at me, and says, "I mean, am I going to be with these?" I said, "You are the example of an online seller. You yeah. are the person who made it." Yeah. What was the business call? What's the business call? You remember? Mytrip.com. Okay. I'm That's almost, cool. I, I, they're still around. That's I a great story. For years, yeah, but but I'll I'll look her up afterwards. With yeah, Wolf, if you want to talk to her, she's awesome. Yeah. So I mean, what's interesting is so your business goes up with the recession. Well, you know, it's funny you mentioned that because a few years ago, when when we had the dip in the markets, people start being creative, right? And That's the beautiful stuff about entrepreneurs. Yeah. About you know about about really the U.S. If you think about people that are flexible. They'll suddenly say, okay, I lost my job. I have a hobby. I have a passion. Right. It's my opportunity to do something I couldn't do before. And with the advent of the internet, obviously, with advent, it's no longer advent. It's been, it's been a while. Right. But you can take a product, put it online. You can take a service and put it online. Look at us communicating right now. Right. right? 20 years ago, it would have been a big production. Yeah. And so we found our number of accounts, for example, goes up during that period. Mm -hmm. Maybe not the biggest volume increase. However, the number of accounts, the startups, mm -hmm. there'll be a lot of attempts and, and very interesting company names. I love looking at our accounts signups every day and looking at these company names that pop up. Because you think about 100 company names a day. Right. What's been some of the strangest them? ones? Yeah. I mean, how oh boy, I... It's always I just ca things that catch my eye. Think about them, I probably, you know, right. I'll, I'll probably get a blank, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know... But, Go ahead. No, I was just saying, it, it just is interesting for me because it continues to amaze me the scale at which companies are created, started, tested is always fascinating to me. It's things that get you excited. Yeah. You know, you say, wow, look at these great ideas or the passion that a, that, that a person has yeah. or a hobby that somebody comes up with. Yeah. Yeah, uh, um, and then they make a business out of it. Yeah. Uh, and you see these folks at different trade shows. And it's always amazing to me. It's always yeah. exciting to me to see that new blood coming into the market, which drives our drives our economy, really. Right. You know, I mean, what's interesting also is you get so much data. Like, you yeah. probably can't think of a name because you have so many names that you're looking at on a daily, weekly basis. I'm curious, what trends do you see in, in e-commerce because you're seeing all these businesses and what they're doing? That's a great question. So, um, let me give you one Positive, one not so yeah. hot. So, you know, w when you look at trends, and, and, and a couple of three years ago, we had a nice little discussion internally saying, the trends we see, can they predict the economy? Right. Right? And, and yeah. you know, we would joke with some colleagues about, you know, this month our shipping volume was strong. You know, when, when the next uh, consumer sentiment right. index comes up, I'm expecting it to be better. And and you can track some of the things like that. So, so let me give you... Yeah. Um, a trend that you can relate, we can relate to the current economic terms. Yeah. Uh, times, um, international shipping had a high growth about three or four years ago. If you th five years ago, if you think of the BRIC countries, right? Right. The BRICs were strong. You had a stronger middle class in some of the emerging economies, and we saw our international shipping going up tremendously. Right. right? The last year and a half you've seen a slowdown hmm. and you see the stronger dollar, right? Currency is making our products high, 
harder to buy abroad. Yeah. But you're also seeing some of the e economies getting slower. So we looked at Latin America, for example. Mm -hmm. But five years ago, it was the big discussion point. Look at Brazil. Look how Brazil's doing. Right. Now, dollar stronger, real is 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 not as strong. Right. The economy is having some issues. We saw a decline over a three-year period of 100,000 shipments a year. Wow. And that's a lot for an emerging country like Brazil. So you right. look at that. Now you take the second step. You say, okay, that's the reason. Now yeah. what do we do something so about it? So what does that mean? Yeah. So, so we went and created a product to take advantage of that so we can help the, the buyers in Brazil. And the, we went and surveyed some of the customers who had a decline in business. And it's one of the few times that we saw... Not you know the dollar was part of it, but the shipping drove shopping in this case, mm. because the shipping to those countries was also a challenge. So we launched a product in in, in uh, about in May of this year. Yeah, it takes advantage of our so what size. does it do? Yeah, allows these small e-commerce sellers to actually act like the big companies, but we take care of it for them, and we get a product to Brazil at about half the cost, and about instead of like. 25 days, it gets there in 10 days. Wow. So suddenly we're hoping we can drive some of that business wow, back. that's amazing. But that's an interesting trend, right? You look at it, you find yeah. a reason. Many folks will walk away and say, okay, now that's the reason. Let me wait till the dollar gets stronger. Let me wait till they fix mm. shipping. We found that for the first time, we might be able to influence it yeah. by going in there and saying, what are the shipping problems? Can we bypass yeah. those and create a new in-between product Given the fact that, you know, as you mentioned, we now have the size of 605 million parcels last year. Right. And we go and bring the economies of scale for our 100,000 merchants or 85,000 merchants and, and bring them something that only the 10 largest companies in the U.S. could have done. So, yeah. so in that, in that, that's, that's an interesting thing. Isn't that it's amazing that you can shift the economy of a country with your, with your company? I don't think we're that good. Well, I mean, I'm not sure we can do that much yet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but you make you make a dent, you know. You will. Yeah, you will. and and what I find too is you're very customer centric, um, so you can do that because of the sheer volume of what you do. So you can, from a kind of scale, offer lower shipping to those, you know, whatever country it is. Is that how you can yeah compete? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and 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 we created like a little mix and match product to get around some of the delays, um, and so we can work with these brokers and in between folks to say, okay, you're used to dealing with a container. Yeah. Instead of a container, we're gonna have enough things to fill a container, but we're gonna send it to you in piecemeal because we have these large customers. Yeah, and for them, it's new business, so they you know they treat us like a container, so we can pass that on to the yeah. to the sellers, and hopefully, yeah. for us, we want our sellers. To be able to grow their business yeah. because they'll ship more with us, right? right. So, so it helps. It's a win-win. Yeah, them. yeah. So. It's it's a lot of logistics involved. Oh, it's all logistics. It's you're absolutely correct. I mean, you've got innovation, but it's innovation in an industry. Logistics been going on for years, right? But it hasn't. It's been really focused on large businesses, right? You you are a Fortune 500 company bringing containers into the U.S., putting it in stores. Now with e-commerce, it shifted the balance, right? You see people that are in the omni-channel. They ship from store, ship from the warehouse. You can return online, you can return in store. So the whole yeah. dynamic now, which was focused on the large companies, now is coming down to those smaller e-commerce sellers. Yeah. And us as consumers and buyers, we're expecting the same experience. Yeah. And that's what we try and bring to those sellers, those shippers, the customers of ours, is these tools that allow them to give the same buying, selling, shipping, receiving experience yeah. that a person would get in store. So yeah, that was one trend, right? Say again? That was one trend that you yeah. saw. So what was another, you said there was another one. Um, so, I mean, we all know returns, right? Returns is something, I mean, if you buy online, your expectation as a consumer, and it's gotten sharpened over the years, is to have a, have a visible, direct returns experience. Right, right. Seven, eight years ago, returns was expected, was assumed, was coming, but was not. The last two years, we've seen it really sharpen right. that if you don't have a clear returns policy, a buyer is less likely to buy from you. I mean, 60% of buyers are less likely to buy. And then we also found for our sellers is 80%, if you have a good returns policy, 80% are more likely to recommend you. So they may mm. promote your business if you have a good returns wow. experience. 
Huh. So the trend on returns was yeah. something, again, we looked at our clientele, and returns were still expensive. Yeah. Expensive from a shipping, from a from a consumer perspective, we expect three returns almost, right? Right, yeah. Come that way. But if you look, it's a cost factor for our sellers. Big time, yeah. Yeah, I mean, they have to still receive it. So we went and looked at different ways, and we came up with a product a year ago that makes the return experience as easy as putting your package in your mailbox and having a carrier pick it up. So hmm. that was a trend that we looked at, and we saw that our shippers, especially the smaller ones, were struggling to come up with a good returns policy. Yeah. You know, what I like about what you, and I want to talk a dig in that you're so customer centric. So, I mean, all the products you create come from some type of customer feedback. Yes. What were some of the, talk about some of the other type of products or innovations in the business and the product feed or the customer feedback of what led to, to that. So I'll, I'll give you, you talked about where we started. Yeah. And those were real interesting. You know, our idea about uh, 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 this product started in the early 90s. Yeah. So um, we were working on uh, software to help. So we had a consulting business first, and we were solving the issue where um, these contracts looked really nice. We put them on laser printers, the first laser printer. They looked really, really nice. But then you had to go to put them in an envelope. You had to take the envelope to a typewriter. <laughs> it seems almost the, absurd right now, yeah. I mean, the whole concept, right? So we had right. this one big typewriter in the office. The only reason, because now we had laser printers, right. was to print, was to type an envelope or to do the express mail. I remember we had this little sheet fed express mail thing that we would type on. Right. So we said, okay, let's automate that. So we automated the printing of an envelope. By, and we there were no envelope feeders then even. So we would spray mountain on an 8.5 by 11. Imagine how, so we put it in the, in the, in the laser printer, center it, and we print on it. So once we did that, it was a good-looking laser printed envelope. We also found that you had to get special envelopes, otherwise they fused. We found we manufactured them early on wow. for our customers. So we're printing these envelopes, and the only thing missing was the postage. We would still have to go up and either put a stamp on it or put a meter. So our concept was really to automate that process. Yeah. So it took us seven, eight, ten years for the poll service to approve us. In 99, 2000, we launched. Yeah. We were coming to launch the product, and here it comes eBay's launching, people are buying online, right. and but the whole world was going about printing envelopes. That was going to be the big business of the future. And us being not funded, we're self-funded, and all the competitors were really looking at envelopes. We said, you know what? Let's go look at what customers want, right? right. When you went to look at the post office, people went to the post office. If they wanted those days, you had to buy a tracking number and tape it on a package. Right, right. You also had to pay for the postage, buy the tracking number. You paid for insurance right. when you wanted to insure the package because those days you also had a lot more insurance because it wasn't, you didn't always know if it got there, it got damaged. And then for the international shipments, you would fill by hand these customs forms in triplicate. Wow, yeah. So we looked at that and us being engineers, we said, that's the problem. It's not as much as we got for 10 years, we're all excited about postage we realized that the importance was really the solution around the postage. Mm. So within about 12 months of us launching our products, we automated those three items. We integrated the tracking with wow. the postage and the address. We had the customs forms, and we got online insurance. So those were all based on talking to people standing in line or, the, or looking at the eBay boards yeah. about all the things people had to do to get a package out. And knowing the, our partnership with the Postal Service, we got to know their operations yeah. and their automation, where they were working. And that's really, you look at that, that's really what launched our business back in uh, 2000, 2001. Yeah. yeah. So are you working like 22-hour days? How do you get that out? You said you, you finished it in like three months? All those three things? All those uh, one year. In, in our first oh, one year? Okay. I mean, you're yeah, working so around the clock. Like, what's your schedule look like? At that, well, this those point? days back in '99, 2000, sure. Yeah. We were seven days. I mean, there was uh, less than 20 of us. Yeah. Right, and we had our business that had to generate the money, the consulting, and our mailing products. Yeah. And then, we we needed to have enough money to survive, and then invest our extra time, in the business to 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 build the shipping business. And so, yeah, there were long days and weekends, and you know. Typical startup, right? Typical company. Right. Um, and we were a small core group, um, and uh, we built the products. We really spent the time. And again, the customers were unbelievably great because we were solving their pain points. Yeah. 
we had incredible feedback. Um, by the time we launched those three items, our ideas for the next three years were unlimited. Really? How do you and keep track of that? Because you probably get ideas every single day. How do you keep track of them and how do you decide at what point you actually go after that problem? Boy, that's probably the biggest challenge we have yeah. until today is it's not the lack of ideas. It's which ones do you execute on right. and then how do you differentiate the small versus the big? Because right. you need to do a lot of the small feature, little fixes, little enhancements because those are the little pain points that our customers have. Right. So we, 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 we got to keep doing that because that's the refresh, the refresh, the extra button, the yeah. one less click. Right, the the movement of the label by half an inch, right. whatever those little things are, right. uh, you know, an extra mail class. We've got to keep doing that to run the business. Yeah. But when you only do that, you lose sight of some of the innovations, like returns I mentioned, like yeah. the Brazil product, right? And so that was our biggest challenge when we started. We were overwhelmed because there was so much newness in the business that the first five to seven years, you were barely keeping up with all the new things. So. Right. We invested, we basically invested the, everything we made into the product and the business and the employees. And every year we'd grow just incrementally a little bit, right. invested in and try and balance what do we need in two years versus what do we need today. So the first few years, it was a lot of today, right? Uh, but you had a smaller product, smaller custom base, so it's easier to go faster. Right. Today, here we are, you know, over 200 employees. You have we, have, we have big project teams, and then we have what we call our small project teams, or right. the day-to-day, -day, and it's a constant balance of resources. It, it doesn't stop. Right. I mean, we may have... The more resources, have, resources you have, you can just take on more, and it just fills up. We always say we have three years' worth of stuff we could be doing. Right. Now I say we have five years' worth of stuff we can be doing. It's, right. it's a great business to be in. Right. Customer base is amazing. Um, you see new business models come up, and we have to support them. And then we try and keep an eye on the trends so we can be thinking a year ahead what our customers will need. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you get it right. Sometimes it's tough. you get it dead. Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> yeah. What are some of the new business models that you see and how do you support them? So, I mean, we talked about returns, right? Or free yeah. shipping, right? Yeah. I mean, those are the customer business models. Yeah. What's putting pressure on our customers today is, for example, let's say free shipping, right? Yeah. So you start telling yourself, um, okay, so we've always helped them ship a certain way. Now, can we find ways to lower their cost? Balance point of do you need it there quickly? Because we've got we support the same day shipping projects that the full service does, right? Yeah. Something called they call Metro Post. Yeah. That I need to get it there today. And then there's the I don't mind it late as long as it's cheap. Right. 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 So you have to cater to the different needs of the sellers, which they're being driven by the buyers, right? So we're starting to do more buyer side research also to try and even help on behalf of our sellers. Yeah. What are trends coming to them faster, right? Mm -hmm. uh, um, one of the things we started working on last year and we're up to two is cross-border returns. It's not hot. To, the consumer buying from overseas from the U.S., their expectations are not like the U.S. consumer who expects free returns. Right. But if you look at the trends, their expectations are sharpening, that they're starting to expect the same, as I call it, the in-country experience. Yeah. So now, if I'm a buyer in France of U.S. goods, that U.S. seller has to treat me the same way the French seller would. Right. So we have to make that shipping experience be the same for our U.S. seller, yeah. but also the French consumer who we don't have a relationship with. Right. So we're doing, we just uh, finished up a cross-border returns on France. We've done it in Canada the last year, where if you are a U.S. shipper selling to Canada, half the sellers would tell the Canadian buyer, if they want to return it, just throw it away. We'll give you money back. It's too expensive to ship it back. Right, right. Right? And so we came up with a product that the U.S. seller can use the U.S. dollars to pay for Canadian label, so because currency is an issue. Right. In the past, they would have to have paid the Canadian dollar yeah. or with a card with, with interchange. So we take care of that. We issue them a Canadian shipping label. This sounds so complicated. Shipping. It's crazy. Yeah. But our job is to take that complicated right. and make it simple. Yeah. Right. I mean, we have to make it so that U.S. seller doesn't have to think twice about it. We in, Internally, one of our brand values, give, give you a little marketing yeah. spin. Go ahead. Complexity is one of my favorite words that came out of a brand study we did three years ago. 
We're into simplexity. We take the complex okay. and simplify. Yeah. We don't sim we're not simple. Okay. We we simplify the complexities. Right, right. right? And, and so it's a little fine line, but that's an example where the buyer doesn't want to know about it. The seller doesn't want to know about it. We should do it in the background. Yeah. There's a lot of logic that says why. Oh, here, do step one, two, three, four, five. And our message to our internal folks is, okay, that's great. That's the reason why there's five steps. That buyer and seller, they don't care. They should not care. Right. Do our job right. Right? They shouldn't have to care. And then right. That brings up innovation. Right. That's when right. you start having... Okay, I'm going to have this Canada Post label printing in the U.S. that you can email to your customer right. in Canada, and have them drop it off with any Canada Post outlet, as easy as if they were doing business in Canada. Yeah. So. So what's top of mind? What is what is the teams working on lately? What's exciting, based off of the customer feedback you're getting lately? Ah, uh, so cross border, right? Yeah. We're really setting up. I mean, it's interesting. We've been doing that for about a year with different aspects of cross board. I mentioned the Brazil product. Yeah. That's a good a good part of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. We're doing more again on returns. Like we call it we always have a phase one where you start your product and you get feedback and now you're in your phase two. And we, we'll start with a subsection of customers. Yeah. Because let's say we'll focus on our mid volume customers, right? And you can have touch points with them. But when you expand it to everybody, you've got to self-serve it. So make it easier to use. We talked about that. So returns is one that we, we want to get to the point that you can do it with your eyes closed. Yeah. That's an exaggeration, but that's like a, one of those goals. Um, looking at the international again, uh, we have about 5% of our customers appear like U.S. customers, but they use us abroad. Hmm. So I'm a business on the border in Canada or Mexico, or I'm in China. I'm a U.S. business that has a factory in China. Mm -hmm. When I get my orders in the U.S., I will produce in China. I may put my U.S. labels on in China. I package them in a bag, drop them in the U.S., and open them up. So we, we're realizing we have to speak to them a bit differently. Hmm. And so we're adjusting. Those are, those are uh, initiatives we have. Um, there's a whole bunch of technology parts that... One of the things we pride ourselves on is um, from a performance of, you know, things that are subtle that we don't talk about, but our shippers expect. The higher sh the higher volume you are, the more you expect instant. So you know, when when you're browsing to a travel website, yeah, you can tolerate a refresh of a page, right? Yeah, you're selling five things a day. You can tolerate that, but when you're in a warehouse, so a segment of our customers are what we call our warehouse shippers or they may be doing, uh, let's say, a 1,000 shipments a day. They may just have it running the entire day or something. Yeah, they have a conveyor belt. Package comes in, they yeah. scan it, a label's got to come out. The same speed of that package, yeah. our label's got to print. Yeah. They can't tolerate a refresh of a page. Right. So we, we have some performance that we've done that gets it in sub-second speeds. Wow. Even with the Internet. Yeah. So we've done some, we, we sponsored some research last uh what what are we now? In November, it was in the in the January March time frame to double the speed of a label, and that sounds so okay. Who cares? Those guys care. Right. So if I'm those are your best go, customer. I mean, they're your biggest yeah, customers. Exactly. Yeah. And so we came up with something. Even the folks that worked on it, it was a theory. Some, but one of our engineers had. Even he thought a twenty percent improvement would be success. We came up with a forty-five percent improvement. Wow. Now it's. An amazing success. Yeah. You know, within a, within months, we'll have that active in our system for those top ten, top fifty sellers. Yeah. That type of stuff. So those things were constantly. There's a technology part. There's an innovation part. There's yeah. a customer facing part. Right. There's so many question follow -up questions with that. I mean, but um, I want to start with what's your your method from obviously you have this objective. We need to improve it twenty percent. It goes forty percent. What's your method for? the team actually accomplishing that. You know, I asked this because I just listened to Scrum like two weeks ago. So I'm curious of what your method is to actually get from here's the goal to 40%, which almost seems unattainable when you talk at that scale. So this one happened to be um, a project, students, three students from a university that we sponsored for two months. They yeah. came out and, and really out to the West Coast. Wow. And one thing is, you know, they can focus, they've got no distractions, and they're given a goal. And 
a goal could be in the end. We've had projects come out and say, nope, we've, we've shown that it doesn't work. And that's great because you prototype it. You haven't taken a whole part of your engineering. Right. And you'll prototype something. The prototype will tell you a lot. Um, we asked the kids, and the kids didn't think at all it was going to be a difference. Our chief engineers thought about it 20%. Of course, we came out with more. So our method was we always have about uh, every two weeks, about six of us get together and we have a list of about 80 projects, probably 80 ideas, let's say. Yeah. Out of those, we'll take always our top five, and somebody on the business end will analyze it a bit more. Mm -hmm. And then there's always the ones that are still proof of concepts. Yeah. And if we have a student group, or we have a special team, we have a technology team also, they, they'll pick off a couple of those when they're, when they're going to come out. Mm -hmm. And then maybe they'll do a proof of concept that we take the next level. Yeah. And then we always keep, we all, I, I love the new blood, you know, if you have somebody, you know, I, I love sponsoring students because you learn from them and it's good energy. Yeah. So we, we have some projects that we know they're pre-prototype stage. And we'll, if, if we have an opportunity to have a team come out, we'll look through that list and say, that one's a good student project. Mm. We literally went through that late last week. We just selected, we have a team coming out in January that will be here for two months. And we looked at an appropriate project for them, and we just selected it. And actually, they start their quarter this week. They'll be preparing this quarter, and they'll come out oh, in January. That's amazing. What and type of students do you look for, and are certain schools do you have a relationship with, or can any school send you, like, sponsored students? You know, I would welcome any school. Uh, we, yeah. we've, we've selected a few more from current relationships. Yeah. So my undergraduate university... Big shout out to Stanford. Worcester Poly Tech. Oh, which, okay, you're Stanford with your mind. Worcester Poly, they, they have a great undergraduate program where hmm. juniors and seniors have to do a project. I mean, you have to do this project to graduate. Yeah. And they have several project centers around the world. They opened the Silicon Valley one, I don't know, over 10 years ago. Right. They used to go visit it just as an alumni. And at some point, we got just big enough where we could afford a project team. And I'm proud to say we supported five different project teams, two of which got project of the year. Wow. The first project team we had, because we're very, we get very involved, our engineers get into it, we support them. At the same time, we give them real projects. Yeah. And so it's computer science kids, and uh, three of them will come out. And so computer science and engineers, or just computer science do you... Well, computer science, computer engineering, mostly it's computer science, okay. uh, this, these, these project teams. Okay. Now, we've also uh, encouraged um, any summer intern to apply. So at any time, we'll have two to five summer interns every summer. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's uh, relatives of uh, employees. Others, it's, we've done a formal program through yeah. our current mother company has a great internship program, which got us started. Yeah. Where we'll have, you know, two, like I said, two to five kids come out. We've had them in, uh, this year we had a person in sales, two people in marketing, mm -hmm. uh, two people in engineering. Yeah. We have a, a, a gentleman right now working on a project that's joint marketing and engineering. So, yeah. you know, big research on package tracking you know we have more than a billion transactions of tracking it's crazy right? yeah it is crazy it's big data gone wild for us it is and so they're looking at trends of how to help shippers decide what where they would be optimizing their locations to ship yeah. and stuff like that so it's really interesting and so we had an uh, 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 econ major mm -hmm. somebody who did uh, actuarial science Right. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, somebody in marketing come out and do some work. So we we've done a yeah. whole variety. We had a computer science sophomore from UC Santa Barbara this summer also. Mm -hmm. So we're looking to do a bit more with them. Yeah. Uh, we just started uh, exhibiting at some of the local universities. Yeah. So also, I mean, we we're, we're blessed that we have you know Stanford, Santa Clara, and uh, San Jose State within you know 20 minutes of our office. So. Yeah. A lot of California schools. I, that's so beneficial for both sides, both parties yeah. there. And I have a, I went to Madison, and so I'll have to, I don't know if people, probably, probably people want to get out of the cold and go to California, but um, I'll have to, to see after we're done with this if, you know, I talked to the um, head of entrepreneurship at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. They have some good people over there, so maybe we'll send them, send them your way. Um, did, I, did I tell you I spent a semester in Madison? I, I thought I read that somewhere. Why? 
What? <laughs> it's a great school. <laughs> so no, I, I started my graduate work there. Oh, really? I did, a, I did a semester in the engineering school in Madison. Okay. I, I did get to go see a football game in Camp Randall. I live very close to Camp Randall. Yeah. Um, and uh, I go there every summer. So, really? Uh, yeah. So do I. Yeah. Yes, there you go. We, we will see each other next summer then. So why only a semester? You mentioned something about the cold. Yeah. That might have might have had a little influence. <laughs> so I did. I told you I did my undergraduate in Worcester Poly in Massachusetts. The mm -hmm. cold, their cold there is a few days of teens, some twenties, and a lot of snow. Thirties, right. right. and it melts. Madison loved it. Had a great time. The snow doesn't melt. Yes. And, and zero is a warm day sometimes. Yeah. So this Mediterranean I, guy, uh, after I hear a while, you. decided. California was calling, and I, that's what moved me out to Stanford. I hear you. I completely agree with that decision. Um, the you know the customer centric part of things. You know, it sounds like early on you were going going on the eBay forums and really discovering the customer issues and what was going on for that. What do you look at now to to discover customer issues, or, or and what are some of the, what are some of the common issues people are are saying, and where do you discover them? So I think I think if you look at the shift. In, in where people go, I think it's following a little bit of the shift of what we see right yeah. now. Obviously, social media has changed a lot from, mm -hmm. from you know, where back in 2000, 2005, forums were a place people went to discuss issues. So eBay had a shipping and packaging forum. There was a couple of independents also. And so those were areas where people with common goals like that would go. Yeah. Today you see, you know, different social media. You see different, you know, uh, Twitter, Twitter uh, uh, sentiment. Uh, you also see, you know, we've always had trade shows be one part of it. I think one thing that works very well for us is the fact today it's different than we were 15 years ago. We had, you know, a handful of customers. Right now we have thousands of customers. Right. So we get immediate feedback from customers. Yeah. We have a great support group and a way to document feedback that comes in, requests, comments, critiques. And then we have a team that always looks at social media. Yeah. There's also still a lot of the marketplaces have their own forums also. Yeah. So we'll get either direct or indirect feedback from that. And then having today, we also have a field sales team and an inside sales team. Or constantly, every day, they're talking to customers, to prospects. Yeah. They're learning from them. We still, even though we've grown, every Friday, we roll up comments to all the senior people. Mm. We will spend, I'll spend a yeah. few hours every Friday afternoon right. getting regional summaries yeah. of all our salespeople with their top three yeah. customers they visited, they, they met with, comments they want to feed back to us. Yeah. And we'll take a handful of those and put them in the hopper and see what we can do with them. Yeah. So it, it's it's really, I think the challenge today is how do we digest all that information? Right. Because, and, and what, which ones uh, 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 percolate, right, right. That, that you can you can spend time on because we've gotten bigger. I think we've had more now, even though we say we're mature. We're right. Mature. You just get more. There's, yeah, there's just a lot. The of volume. Money. Yeah. So what's what come up lately in those Friday sessions what's one that so um it, it's interesting you look at today so let's look at the trends you look at the trends in the industry you mentioned earlier and yeah. i think this relates well um today retail is trying to redefine itself right the footprint of a store today might be different in three years right right uh uh today there's a debate between do you want to distribute your warehouses or do you want to ship from store yeah or do you want to do a bit of both so uh, we're looking at initiatives for next year. You look at ship from store is something we pioneered with a couple of customers back in 2005, 2006. We backed into it, right? So we, we, we played around with it a bit. We have a couple of big customers that do that. Yeah. And so we're looking at it again. And retail, as they're evolving and competing in the world of e-commerce, having that omni-channel experience, people started talking about it two years ago. Last year, you started seeing, okay, let's manage our inventory. Let's figure out, I got to know if this dress in size X is it in my warehouse or is it in the mall store? Is it in the town store? And from a mm. shopper, when you're at that counter asking, do you have size 8? You've got to be able to keep that customer, whether it's in, in, uh, in stock 
whether you're going to drop ship it to them to get it there next day. Right. That part we're getting more involved in. That yeah. is a trend that we've gotten in our research, yeah. publications, and then talking to some of our large customers. They're like, we need to solve this problem. Yeah. Otherwise, the shoppers are going to bypass us. Yeah. I saw that personally when I went into a sporting goods store and was looking for something like, oh, we have this other store. It's going to take like, I'm like, well, I actually need it in like the next two days. So I'll just go to another store. And yeah, they couldn't solve that issue for yeah. me. So I just went to another store. Yeah. yeah. I mean, two of our customers, what they to do today, Jeremy, they're both athletic stores. Uh, one of them is a regional, about 180 stores. One of them is yeah. national, about 4,000 stores. And if you were to go up to their, their you know, person who's probably a high schooler sitting at the counter, right. they will tell you, uh, you know, Jeremy, we'll take your order right now, and you'll have it at your doorstep in X days. Right. And when they take your order, they will punch it in, and then their, their back office system finds the closest store or warehouse. Hmm. But usually it's the store right across town. Why? Because two things. First, it'll get to you by tomorrow or the day after. Yeah. Plus, shipping is less expensive. Yeah. It's you know, you're shipping five miles, right? Right versus oh you're in Chicago and my warehouse is in Miami. Yeah, right. No, yeah. I'll pick you know six stores in Chicago instead of telling you can you drive across town in Chicago traffic, right? <laughs> They'll say don't worry about it, we'll get it to you. Yeah, and and you would have said okay good, I don't have to go look again. Are you sure it's the same color? Yep, just the, here. Let's try the size shoe, this other shoe, but we'll get you the color that you want. Right. And yeah. So, you know, also, I mean, before we were talking, before we were sort of recording, we were talking about travel schedules and you keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on, you know, not only with your company, but outside of the company. So I'm wondering for people out there, what trade shows or conferences should people look to attend in e-commerce that will be helpful for them that you find valuable? That's, that's a great question. I, I think you're also seeing a lot more these days coming yeah. up, right? Yeah. I think there's it depends. I, I say there's two parts. One, there's the shipping logistics part. But two, you should really look at your industry. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not an expert on every industry. Right? Right. We talked about sporting industry. I don't think I go to any of the shows that are sporting related. But right. I'm sure there's half a dozen that have a yeah. logistics track in them that's very customized to a sporting yeah. apparel store. But we do have a show that we go to. I have not been to yet. That's called Outdoor Retailer, for mm -hmm. example. And so it's it's specific within that show. There may be something about shipping, right, or right. logistics, or e-commerce. That's but, why I uh, ask you because every you could technically justify any conference because you handle in multiple, you know, many different industries. Right, and yeah. and so and and that's why my first advice is don't listen to me. Listen to the industry that you're in. Yeah, right. Good Your advice, pharmaceutical yeah. industry. It's a very different package size, speed, security. Uh, uh, um, laws around pharmaceuticals and it's going to be about a t-shirt being sold. Yeah. Having said that, there are some common shows that go cut across the verticals. So there's a show, it's every other year in Chicago called Internet Retailer in June. Mm -hmm. Big fans of that show. We exhibited the first year it opened, wow. I want to say seven or eight or nine years ago. Mm -hmm. We shared a booth with a partner of ours and from then on we've exhibited Mm -hmm. uh, I told you, you know, we bumped into each other. We talked last week or the week before. Yeah. I was at par the Parcel Forum. It's yeah. a very a specific uh, logistics parcels show. And it typically is in Chicago. The year before it was in Dallas. Yeah. Uh, there's an annual show the Postal Service hosts, hosts called the National Postal Forum. Yeah. It's usually in the April, May time frame and they alternate East, West Coast. Uh, another show that's more e-commerce, which is gaining momentum, is, is shop.org. Okay. Is yeah, I did uh, see that. Yeah. So th th that's a handful. So tell me about this. I mean, this is interesting because you you were at the first show, the Internet Retailer Show. So how is it? How is it then? And how is it different now? Okay. So when they did the first one, they had a magazine for the longest time. Yeah. Right. So they were able to attract a lot more than I would have expected in the first year. Mm. But what hit me right away is walking around. I remember calling the office from the show, telling them, this is the show that's going to be the one that's going to be our show. You knew that right and away. It, it was amazing to see the presence of companies there because yeah. you had a good mix. You had marketing firms, for example, that helped sellers market online, right? Yeah. So you had that, 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 that group. Then you had a few of the carriers, so the shipping. 
Um, you also had the software firms that helped you market your product, to list your product, to sell your product, the e-commerce engines out there that not only cater to the small seller, but cater to the Fortune 200. Yeah. And that was one that I had not seen. I had not seen a show that had that, uh, that range of yeah. offer, yeah. where it could go all the way to the person doing 10 a day, not two a day, but 10 a day, all the way to, I'm a Fortune 500 retailer with 6,000 stores, right. and I have warehouses, and I need trucking and small package shipping. Right. So it, and, and they did that in their first year. Their first and year, that, okay, wow. Uh, today, of course, they're even bigger. They have a lot more exhibitors. They have some great presentations and yeah. seminars for online sellers. Um, and, and they've continued to really build on that. Uh, yeah. They were in the McCormick Center the, this year. That's impressive that from the first year they attracted those big companies. That's what got my attention. Yeah. Why is it in Chicago? The is strong. Sorry? Why is it in Chicago? We were talking about the cold. Why do they have it in Chicago? There must be some reason. It's still cold when they no, have it. In June, it's pretty nice. Oh, it's in June. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Plus, I think they're based, they're based out there, too. Yeah. So, the other thing, I mean, it was interesting is how you, your marketing. You were talking about the simplexity, you know, and I never thought that someone could, re could create a sexy, good marketing video on shipping. And, and you guys <laughs> have managed to do that. I encourage anyone to actually check out the YouTube channel, and it's called The Best Best holiday shipping boot camp video. I don't know. You know what I'm talking about. Tell me about creating that and the thought process. And you just have to watch it on YouTube just to to get a sense of it. It's so well done and creative. Um, how did you even think of that? And, and you know, tell me about creating that. So let's be very very specific, clear. I am not the creative. <laughs> I, I, I'm an innovator. I'm a product creative. Right. But when you come to those things, we have an awesome team. Yeah that thinks through these things, works with some agencies, and we, we like to think of ourselves as a little quirky, a little, little sort of, you know, we, we professional in the business end, right. take the business seriously, but not take ourselves too seriously. Yeah. And I think we project that in, in, in these videos. Yeah. You know, there's also the the school video, you know, your shipping 101 video, and, and, and they're kind of fun, they're light, uh, because shipping, shipping is a burden, it's a task. Right. But it's a must-have if you're going right. to succeed, right? Where, yeah. where, and and in, a, in a way, and so we like to sort of bring that little bit of uh, fun to it. So. I mean, do you know, like, obviously, there's a kind of a format. Does everyone get and just go on a whiteboard and write ideas? Like, how do they come to the final product, or do you just kind of bounce things off of an agency that that does this every day? So you know, different different groups have had different ways of doing it in the company. Yeah. Um, this one, what we've done very nicely in our marketing group is bring not just agencies, but also our own folks. We listen to our customers, listen to support, and come up with some concepts, mm -hmm. and then we'll bounce them around. Yeah. And then it starts building the idea. And uh, it's a fun process. I mean, and, and now, it used to be uh, 10 years ago, we're like, 10 years ago, we'd have been uh, probably 35 people. Yeah. yeah, it was a company endeavor. Now we've got some incredible folks in our marketing team that will, you know, get some customer input. They may go ask a couple people to support, maybe cross-functional, and then we'll sit with some of our, our partners and, and, and agencies and come up with a few concepts, and then we've worked with some local companies that are just fun, that have some yeah. good ideas, and, yeah. and they're creative, and, and yeah. then we try things. We've thrown away things, right? I mean, it's obviously yeah. you can expect that you do that. So, yeah, but it, it's, it's fun. It's I like fun. to know that because you know, people out there listening who want to create their own marketing or videos, I like to know that process. And also, if you can make shipping sexy and fun, then probably you could make anything. <laughs> you know, you know, very true. Yeah. My, my kids did not think what I did was exciting. So. <laughs> I mean, it's not a did it. You know, what has, you know, ask me what trends have changed. Yeah. Ten years ago, you were not going to talk about shipping at the dining room table. Yeah. In the last four years, you do. And you can talk about, hey, I bought this, it shipped, the package came in, it's at my doorstep. It was not a dinner time conversation. Yeah. And that has changed. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. We, we're, our mindset now is expecting one of the, the options will be to buy online. Yeah. I mean, Zappos also, you know, Zappos has probably increased that, you know, that, that yeah. 
you can ship anything back. People buy, you know, 10 boxes of shoes and ship them all back. Yeah. 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 I mean, but those kind of companies, those innovators in the field, Zappos is a great example, but there's like 20 Zappos or 50 Zappos out there that have conditioned our thinking over the years. Yeah. That when you said the word, we joked, we used to always say, shipping's not sexy. The last three or four years, we're saying, you know what? It's starting to have a bit of that. Right, right. So how did, I mean, how did Amazon affect business? You know, because you were pre-Amazon. So I'd say about the same time, right? I mean, but what Amazon has done is made shipping a topic of discussion. Right. I like to think if uh, our colleagues there have really set the bar up very nicely. I mean, yeah. they have helped the consumer uh, think about that experience in a different way. And for that, they have set the bar higher for all other businesses to provide that great consumer experience. Right? Mm -hmm. You mentioned Zappos, obviously, they're owned by Amazon now. Yeah. But, um, and that has had us really innovating even more to serve our shippers to give them the same tools, functionality, so they can appear to their buyers as professional and as amazing as Amazon does. So yeah. we like to think of all the independent merchants that may sell on Amazon, by the way, because yeah. we integrate with Amazon. Amazon's a great partner. Yeah. Um, but also, those sellers sell on multiple platforms. They sell on their own website. They sell on Amazon. That's a channel for them. So they have set the bar up very nicely. And of course, we all innovate to help our shippers achieve the same results and perception from their buyers uh, for that great shopping experience, online shopping yeah. experience. Yeah, because it was apparent, obviously you said, you know, as eBay grew, your business grew in, in the shippers unit. Did you see the same trend with Amazon or did it, was it a little bit different? I, I think now as the industry has gone, we use, I use eBay more directionally from the sense in 2000, right, that, that was a little bit of where it started. But really the whole e-commerce ecosystem has grown, right? If you look at the metrics on, on the growth of the market, uh, Amazon is, is probably the largest, of course, and that's whose name comes in. But we saw earlier this year with the Alibaba's IPO, right? Mm -hmm. For me, at least, and what I read, there was a lot of uh, discussions about that. Uh, a lot of those marketplaces that are no longer just domestic, right? They're international. Um, and so you see those trends, those are driving the whole e-commerce uh, uh, ecosystem is driving businesses up, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, what's interesting too, I mean, we talked uh, about a fun fact about you that most people don't know, which actually makes perfect sense um, because of Indisha, but you used to collect stamps from a elementary school to high school. And what I also, you know, with the research saw, um, saw that you grew up in the Middle East. So what was it like growing up in the Middle East? You know, it, I, I was born in Holland, so my parents moved around a lot. I, yeah. I was in uh, five schools in four different countries. Wow, really? So, what countries? So, uh, so through fifth grade, I was, uh, it went Libya, Lebanon, Egypt, New York. I consider New York a country. <laughs> New York as an eighth grader, wow. living with my grandmother in Long Island. My. Then back for four years of high school in Lebanon. Oh so, my God. so yeah, we moved around a lot. Uh, Dad started his business and, and had opportunities. Mm -hmm. And then of course, mm -hmm. the Middle East, with the instabilities in the Middle East, you end up being forced to move sometimes. What so, kind of uh, business was it? Uh, uh, mechanical contracting. He's mm -hmm. a, a firm and you know, still, still till today. And so, um, uh, you know, we moved around a lot. So yeah, I. I, you know, from from a teenager growing up, other than you know civil wars here and there, which didn't help, but it was great experience. I mean, just that's what we had. The family was right. half my uh, parents' family is or was overseas, and yeah. so uh, uh, grew up there, and you know went to school there in multilingual schools, and and uh, then when I had the opportunity to come to university in the states, yeah. driven by the fact of the instabilities, I, I came out here when I was seventeen. So you went to high school in Lebanon. Yes. So what was it like? Is it, I mean, do you think it was the same here? What, what are the differences? So it was interesting. First, it was a British-founded school. Yeah. Uh, run, I mean, it had a uh, British board of directors in Lebanese, so English was one of the main languages. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's different than probably what a U.S. school would be, just because the same thing you would say if it was in England or France. You know, there's different styles right, for each right. countries. Lebanon had the French educational system. 
in English though, took it in English, uh, trilingual education. Yeah, so, so what, how, what, uh, what languages do you speak? I speak uh, in English, of course, and <laughs> Arabic, which uh, uh, was the native language, and then French, because both my parents spoke French at home. They were French educated. And uh, it was the third language you learned in school, but because we moved around a lot, never, had a, uh, uh, never studied a lot, but I'd like to say I'm conversational in French. Yeah. And since about 5% of our business is in France, we do have a French uh, uh, product. Comes in handy. So, so I do get to practice my French. Yeah. So, I mean, when you were young, what did you want to be when you grew up? That's a great question. Um, you know, I always had an engineering part to me. I always felt, it, it, I had, well, I, I mean, funny, early high school, I had three things I thought about. So yeah. just, it was either going to be engineering, because I liked solving things, and, yeah. and, and, you know, just from an academic And you saw your dad, what he did, too. Yeah. My dad was not an engineer. He was a, he was a business uh, major. Oh, okay. The business the entrepreneur part, I like to say, came from my dad and, and, and running the business. So it was going to be engineering, business, or history. Loved history. history. I'm, I'm a child of history. And uh, I remember sort of discussions about would that be a major and, uh, or, or a hobby, right? You kind of balance the two. Yeah. So what can you do? What do you need school for? And what do you do that you don't need school for? And, and so uh, those are the three subjects I, I always sort of had in mind in high school. Did you think about going with your dad at all or no? Yeah. 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 Dad always thought I'd come back and be with him in the business. And we considered that. You know, it was, yeah. it was one of my options. And I remember when I, Harry and I talked and we were starting the company. Uh, about sort of, you start a company here, you know, dad had his company in the Middle East, and that was a thought we had for a while. Yeah. Uh, but I, I preferred to be out here, and, and obviously coming out in Silicon Valley was a lot of fun. Yeah. And then meeting Harry uh, kind of cemented it. It was, it was kind of fun, and we thought we'd give it a try, and of course it worked out. So what do your sons want to do? Say again? What do your sons want to do? <laughs> Uh, my older son's in college now, so he's pretty. He, you know, he's a chemical engineer. He's studying to be a chemical engineer. Hmm. Uh, has his first interview today, so there you go. All right. <laughs> I mean, does he want? Do you think he wants to come work at the company eventually, or no? Different, different career, right? He's a chemical engineer. We're not. Hmm. I don't think we're getting into chemical engineering. No. I don't think so. I don't, well, <laughs> I your don't major know. was what? Mechanical. You're in mechanical. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but you know, we always Harry was mechanical. Also, we always said, you know, we learned how to solve problems, and and find find practical solutions mm -hmm. to issues. And I think that's problem solving skill set, yeah. and the hands on skill set we took from our engineering is probably till today, what motivates us is how to solve problems. Yeah. So, and we always sort of use that as an example when we're faced with. An issue where other people say, "Oh, that's a problem. Let's go do this." And we're like, yeah. "That's a problem. Let's go figure out how to resolve it, solve it, innovate with it, get around it, whatever it is." Uh, yeah. um, it's like fun. Yeah. <laughs> and you mentioned, you know, Dr. Harry Whitehouse, who's your co-founder, and he was your teacher at yes. Stanford. What what big lessons have you learned from from him? So first things, the way we met was always interesting because I was a student of his class and then I applied to be a TA in the class. Yeah. And we both thought that was kind of weird. In first class, he's like, well, I never had a student be the TA in the same class. Right. And then I told him it was a last quarter Stanford. I was a grad student. Half the class were undergrads. And, and so next, next lecture, he came in and said, you know what? You're the most qualified. The first thing we learned is we both thought outside the box. Yeah. The fact that I applied for something that didn't make any sense, the fact he even considered it, uh, and, and both of us always felt that was what we had a commonality is yeah. uh, we didn't have to conform. There was, there was nothing lost in having that discussion and when it made sense. So that, that practical way of looking at things was probably a commonality. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I always loved, his, he was always, his lectures were just fantastic because he always had five or ten minutes that were not related to what we were studying. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I saw a video of him painting his car because he rebuilt his car in the garage. And what not to do, never paint a car in a garage. So it just destroys the garage. Uh, so that was a lesson. Okay, take, take that for <laughs> We're talking like 30 years ago now, right? Um, the other thing I always remember, and I tell that to people over here, you know, we're, we're in an age of email and, 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 and social media. And we, our comfort zones have changed. A lot of people won't pick up a phone, won't have a Skype session like you and I are having. Mm -hmm. And one of the lectures, Harry Potter, he would always have this, this like, you know, cardboard box, he'd bring things in with him. 
And it was always something different. And one of the last weeks of the class, he says, okay, a lot of you guys are engineers who are going to go out and work. And um, you'll get comfortable at your subject matter. And you'll be doing this or that. And he bought out this old phone, put it on the desk, and he says, never forget to talk to people. Hmm. Things are resolved when you pick up a phone and talk to somebody. Yeah. And that rings true till now. Yeah, yeah. I've seen people revert back and I see these email chains on something or social media or, right. or you know, we, we get removed from the people we work with. Work with yeah. And yet that sometimes makes, we create obstacles sometimes. Yeah. Then a nice friendly phone call or go break bread with somebody. Right resolves things very easily that's true. And, and so that's one I always take I always remind myself when yeah. I'm sitting at my desk I'm answering I've got my 200 emails or 500 emails today <laughs> get up walk right. over to the person and talk to them yeah thank you yeah I love that I love that reminder too um, what's been you know when you get tens of thousands of customers that's a great thing but what are some of the challenges what have been some of the challenges of growing you know um, Different phases of our company, we always face challenges. That, that's our job is, is really to look at this right. challenge. And I think that, that's really how businesses succeed, right, is, is taking these challenges and, you know, uh, the, the, in, in a nice sense, turning them into what we like to call nicely opportunities, right? right? Um, the biggest challenge we always have consistently faced is how do, where do you put your energy, right? We talked about earlier yeah. the innovations and priorities. And so constantly we're balancing these priorities and making decisions and how do, what are the, you mentioned the criteria to make those decisions. Sometimes it's analytical, but don't forget your gut. I tell some of folks, you, you've got to have some gut in there. Sometimes it's a gut and you've got to go against the analytics. You know, when are you right? When are you wrong? Yeah. The other thing I like to say is make the mistake fast and move on because you can't overanalyze something. You've got to analyze, but you've got to know a balance point between I can spend eight months analyzing it, or I can spend two weeks doing it. Right, right. Or prototyping it, and then learning, but not having that connection that says, okay, since I did it, let me continue. No, sometimes you gotta walk away. Yeah. Those balance points, I think, are critical for any small business. Uh, you know, do you, how, you don't wanna not stick with something, but you gotta know when sometimes you've stayed with something too long. Yeah. And you don't wanna keep hopping either, because you're never gonna get anything done. And making that balance, well, making those judgment calls and being comfortable making that mistake and owning up to it and just saying, okay, we made a mistake, let's move on. Or here's the decision. And, and an example I would have is investment examples every year. We say, okay, shall we fund this project or that project? Or shall we invest in our infrastructure? And, and, and every year we say, okay, maybe this year will be the year of this and we'll have postponed this for next year and next mm -hmm. year we do that. And those kind of decisions we make every, every couple of months I would say yeah. without yanking things back and forth but making adjustments along the way not yeah. we need to have a plan but we can't be inflexible yeah see so. I thought one of the things you were gonna say was eventually integrating with the US Postal Office how was that journey how long did that take and you know what was that process like so it was interesting because the first time we approached the post service we were seven employees at the company yeah and you can expect an agency that has north of half a million employees of being approached by a, a company with, uh, you know, uh, the professor from Stanford or, and, you know, some kids uh, from California going out to Washington, D.C. And we, were, we had an audience which was very respectful and, and we did have a discussion, but there was no way these seven people were going to be taken seriously. And so that was a challenge. Yeah. That was a challenge, but we, we had persistence. Some, some people call it stubbornness. Um, right. and when we had an idea, we believed in it, um, and we didn't let it take us over, though. That was the other thing. We knew we had to run a business. We could not, we knew we didn't own our schedule completely because there were things we had to be approved for. We were printing, I mean, if you think about it, one of the things we do, we print money. Yeah, yeah. Postage is currency. And if we're looking at that back in 90, 90 91, when computers were still immature, right. How to secure that. So we Yeah, can't someone just photocopy your, your thing and just stick it in? I mean, that's one of the things we had to protect against, right? right? We had to be able to put both a... Sometimes you have to um, um, analyze it. Sometimes you have to protect it. Sometimes you have to sort of, you know, build some controls around it. And those are some of the things we did. And we matured our process. And we were persistent to the point that three years later, the Postal Service uh, allowed us to do a proof of concept work. 
Yeah. And uh, and we established some great relationships with some very smart people at the Postal Service yeah. to, to look at this as uh, a positive alternative. Yeah. Speaking of Chicago, it, sometimes things happen in the industry that will um, influence how people think about what you're doing. So back in the, I want to say early 90s, maybe 94, 95, there was the uh, Congress post office scandal where some postage were being, was being reused or being sold or something along those lines. Right, yeah. And that, since we were secure serialized, because every time you print posters with us, it's got a unique ID. Yeah. You can, tra- you can say who did it, when they did it, versus I give you $1,000 to go pay postage with, it's loose currency, right? Right, right. And so, we, and so that gave us a little more visibility to what we were doing those mm. days. I can't remember, it might have been 93 even, might have been earlier. And that gave us an audience because we had that idea. Now suddenly that idea said, hmm, it might resolve this. Right, Allowed your solution. Sort of take the, yeah, a lot of stick the idea forward. So those those were big challenges where, you know, as, a, as a, you go back to your entrepreneur concept, those are some of the things where our long-term vision was to be able to do this. But along the way, we knew we had to have small steps, yeah. build up confidence, but we also needed to be able to still run our business that was going to generate just enough money for us to survive to get to yeah. that long-term vision, right? Yeah, yeah. And I mean, part of the equation with business is competition, you know. And so I want you to talk a little bit about patents. And when I was doing the research, I was reading an article on e-commerce bytes, and I didn't realize there's a, such a history of conflict with Stamps.com and Indicia. Well, I wouldn't say, it, you know, the patents, when you look at the... I'm just, I'm uh, quoting the article. That's, that's yeah, what they yeah, said. Yeah, they yeah, go, yeah. There's a, the article says there's a history of conflict. I'm like, huh, Amin seems like a ni- such a nice guy. I'm just <laughs> no, and the, the, the gang there is nice too. No, when you look at patents, right, and, yeah. and patents are something that are sensitive throughout different industries. Yeah. And uh, we had some of the first patents on the concept. Yeah. Uh, obviously, you know, where, where it says there's a concept of postage and then there's how you use it. And, of course, we used it in shipping. And so the usage was very different. The application was different. We went into the shipping industry as opposed to a lot of folks went into the mailing industry. And and we differentiate that quite a bit. But we've always focused on the innovation, right? And right. so one of the things I think we were very smart about way back in 89, 90 was patenting some of that and then using that mm-hmm. in appropriately so that you also didn't just patent it and you know, try and sell your patents. You really used it and put the products. So it's to defend so, defend your intellectual yeah, property. Yeah, exactly. And and you see that with innovators um, that think about the whole piece. Yeah. And I think that goes back to a little bit of Harry's background. Prior to this, he, he, did, he had some solar energy patents way yeah. back in, in the mm, 80s. Really? Wow. Yeah, so, so, so we had innovated in that area. So we had the concept and you know, we wrote the patents ourselves with some help from law firms. But those are things that we did early on. And uh, like anything else, you know, it, it, it gives you the, it, it allows you to then 10 years later be able to launch that product or five years later be able to put that innovation. Uh, and we've always looked at that as, as it's a source of what we're doing. Right. And, and it will be the future. And, and that, that, that helped a lot. Yeah. What is the competition? I mean, obviously there's other com- competitors. What is the competition like um, between Stamps.com? Or you know, what do you see that relationship as far as the, the competition went throughout the years? Like, what did you learn from Stamps.com? So I would say, you know, really we don't look at it that. We look a lot about the industry. Like we talk about the customers, right? Mm-hmm. You mentioned earlier our, our obsession about customers. And yeah. that's really, when we look at the business, the product, the, the, the marketplace, we look at what a customer looks at. So today, if I'm an e-commerce seller, I'm trying to look at what am I going to do to get my product to my consumer, right? And when I look at that, the first option is, do I use the post office? Do I use UPS? Do I use FedEx? If I'm a big volume shipper, I might use my own trucks right, yeah. to get it somewhere. If I'm localized, I might use my, my uh, the, what do you call them, the, the local bi- bicycle uh, cat, I know what you're couriers. talking about. Yes, yes. The couriers, that's the word, right? If I'm if I'm in Chicago, New York, San Francisco, and I've got a pharmacy and I'm set, I'm doing local traffic, I might have a bicycle courier do it, right? Yeah. So when you look at an e-commerce seller, to me, that's how they think, right? So then you say, well, how do I solve that? And so in our case, obviously, yeah. we solved it in shipping, and that was the business we focused on: mm-hmm. is those shippers 
and they were back for the you know, last you know, 15 years, they were less catered to because it was more complex. You mentioned the complexity. Yeah. And so where we may have, you know, let's say 100,000 customers, a lot of the, 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 the companies that cater to small businesses may have a million customers, but they may do the same amount of shipping just because the demographics of your small office that is sending a letter, it's very different than I am a seller selling a product that's shipping something. Yeah. And that's how we focus and that's how our sellers look to us. And their competition was more like UPS and FedEx and, and all those, all those uh, local couriers and all the things that would transport a parcel. And we were an enabler to that parcel transportation. Yeah. I mean, this has been hugely valuable, and I want to thank you. I have, I have one last question for you, but where can we point people towards? Where should they find out more about the company and, and you? So, obviously, come to our website, indicia.com, E-N-D-I-C-I-A.com. Uh, come up to our shipping blog. We're having a lot of fun with that. There's hmm. some, some nice articles. It's, it's really uh, it's something... Uh, we created a couple of years ago, and uh, it's it's really starting to have a lot of followers. Hmm. Has not starting. That was a year yeah. ago starting. Now it yeah. does, and uh, a lot of folks go there to get their information. I visited so in Madison this summer. I went and visited a couple of customers, and I was very happy to. I would go in and I said, "Oh yeah, we were looking at your shipping blog and some of the articles." And I picked up these two, and I have questions about them. That's I'm great. Like, okay, I walk into somebody and they're saying, "Look at it. It's now becoming a source." It's a conversation. Uh, for yeah. information. Yeah. So I encourage people to look at that. Um, uh, there's a lot more today. Like you mentioned, shipping is sexy. I mean, there's a lot more. From that video. I only mentioned it from that video. Before, <laughs> I did not think it was that sexy, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I, I guess maybe you should go to the YouTube channel. Yeah. Then, right? And and according to you, we should go to the YouTube channel on Indisha. Yeah. And, and try and figure out, let, let's see how many people agree with you and think that shipping is sexy. Yeah. I would leave that. I would leave them with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, everyone should check out Indisha.com. And my last question is, you know, since it's Inspired Insider, I always ask, you know, this has been a long journey, you know. So what's been the low point and what's been the proudest moment? You know, I, I think we, we always stayed even keel. Mm -hmm. the, between the three partners, I, th I think we always, my best experience is, is, is really the, the, the two co-founders that we were all three of us together. Um, you know, low points were probably in the 90s when we just didn't think this would, I mean, nobody was going to take us seriously, right? Which is typically with a lot of entrepreneurs. Yeah. Um, the, the fact that, okay, was this ever going to be real? How yeah. much would we wait? The patience level to wait nine years till you're approved. Right. Uh, like It's like an FDA drug, but you don't have the billions to spend. Right. The low points, we had low points then, but we kept our mind on the business and the current customer, the business model we had. Yeah. So we kept it going. Um, Is that what kept you going, just thinking about the customer? or what? what you know, because that's, that's a lot of patience. I mean... Well, you know, I, I, I've told some people, ask me some... We had a new employee lunch, and, and we were talking about it. And I said, you know, me and the co-founders, we probably, you know, if we had to sell cucumbers together, we would have had fun. Right. And so you always wanted to come into the office because we, we had a fun environment. We still do. We're, we're, we're very close together, um, and that made it fun. That made it you could do anything together. Yeah. So we had a consulting business. We had our big clients. We had our mailing business, our direct mail software that we built, mm. and we stayed close with our customers there. And so we were profitable we were small you know you know, running a business we always thought this next level was going to be the big one which it turned out to be yeah. uh, the high point was probably the day we got approved yeah. I mean, we, we created a nice little cute first day of issue you know because you know there's a big ceremonial thing about about stamps uh, and, and postage and, right. and stuff like that uh, and and when we finally got that but then realizing right away that we had the wrong business model that was a kind of fun we said we got to go to shipping. Shipping is where it's at. Oh my God, there's all these other complexities. Let's go do it. Yeah. You know? and, and, I, and it was both the high point and the point that said, okay, we got approved now. Now let's make sure we can solve, continue to solve problems, not to get caught up with, yeah. is that the end of the journey? It really was the beginning of the journey. So you it's say down. approved. When you say approved, what do you mean by that? So we're, the, the money part of our business, the postage part of our business, mm -hmm. the, 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 now it's a small part of the bigger shipping, yeah. 
is regulated, right? You print money. Yeah. So you have to be approved by the U.S. Postal Service. I see. Yeah. And there's a handful of companies that are approved to yeah. process postage or process the Postal Service's money yeah. is another way to look at it. That's a huge um, win, yeah. Yeah, and, and so there was a whole journey. You have to pay these outside labs to, 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 to certify you. Yeah. Go, that, that's a tough journey. It's a tough hill, mountain to climb. And we went through that. And so that was a success point was right there that mm. now the rest was up to us. And every, along the ways, we've always you know, faced hurdles to expand that model past its original concept of a small business yeah. all the way to the shipping entities. So, and that continues to obviously every year we have these, these, these things we, we grow on. Yeah. Um, but we kept an even keel, and I think it was a lot to do with the people around us and, and, and the team as it's grown. That's what the fun part of being, you know, having a business is a lot of the interactions you have on a daily basis. Yeah. That remains to be, that's con that's been constant throughout our growth. Yeah. I mean, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. As we talked, you probably had 600 emails built up. But I, pre I appreciate so I, it. I had, this was fun. I mean, I looked forward to this. This is, this is a great time. And now I know next time I'm in Madison, I'm going to drop you a long That's right. Ride. And Good. Chicago. Yeah. It's Chicago too. But yeah. I, I think Madison's going to happen first, somewhere on State Street. All right. <laughs> let's do it. I look forward to Thanks it. Thanks, Thank I much. appreciate it. Good.